Good morning. All right. Um, just a couple of things um, before we get started today, because um, we've got to finish up 4.6. Um, don't forget there is a homework assignment on 4.5 and 4.6. That's due tomorrow night by midnight. Okay, so Tuesday night by midnight. So if you haven't finished that one already, um, we'll definitely finish up the material for that tonight uh, or for today. And so you'll be able to finish that up by, by tomorrow night for sure. Um, if you have any questions about it, as always, send me questions through WebAssign. Um, if you need to set up time to meet with me about anything, um, just email me and let me know. Um, I already have an office hour scheduled with somebody tonight for sure, um, but tomorrow night um, I'm pretty open. So if you need to schedule some time, um, probably tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow night would be good. Um, we will finish up the last two examples in 4.6 today, um, so we might actually finish up a little bit early. I want to get to the practice test, but I'm probably just going to wait and save that till tomorrow so we have the full day, the full 50 minutes to work through the practice test. Um, and then um, that'll be it for tomorrow also. And then once we've done that, we've only got one more chapter left to go, um, and we'll get through as much of that stuff as we can. Um, I might have to cut a little bit just because, you know, we've lost a week in there and some other days here and there. So I'm going to do my best to get through as much as I possibly can. Um, Sarah, I don't know that I have. Um, so let me actually check that while I've got while you're asking that question. Um, so let's see. So test prep, test for. There we go. All right. So yeah. So that if you look under test prep now, um, test four and the test four solutions um, should be available if you want to start looking at that but like i said tomorrow during class um, we'll actually go through that practice test also um, and i will also make sure that i get test four posted this afternoon um, and that'll be due a week from today and so you'll have until monday of next week okay any other questions all right so let's go ahead and jump back into 4.6 then. Um, so we looked last week at radioactive, uh, or we looked at exponential growth, right? So we looked at doubling time. Um, we looked at things where we had a growth rate. So now we're going to look at, well, what if we're going the other way, right? So what if something's decaying exponentially instead of growing exponentially? And so this is going to be our formula that we use for that. And the most common practical application of this is going to be radioactive decay, um, where you're either given a half-life of some radioactive material or you know the decay rate of that radioactive material. And so we can use this formula here. If you're actually given the rate, the percentage, then we can use the formula M of T equals M sub zero E to the negative RT. Notice that formula looks very, very similar to the growth formula that we looked at last week. The only difference now is that we have a negative in front of our rate. Okay, so since we're decaying instead of growing, we just have to make the rate negative, um, but otherwise the formula looks exactly the same. If you're not given the rate and you're given the half-life instead, we can actually use this R equals natural log of 2 divided by H, substitute your half-life into that, and then we'll have our R value that we can go right back to that same formula, right? So rather than memorizing really two different formulas for half-life versus decay rate, we can just memorize the decay rate formula, and as long as we know how to find that rate given the half-life, then we can always use that same formula. Okay, and so that's kind of what we're always going to try to do here. Um, rather than using, there is one that has a one-half as the base, um, but I think it's, you know, kind of not really worth it to memorize those two different formulas if we can always use the same one. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this one. So we've got polonium-210 has a half-life of 140 days, and we're going to suppose that a sample has a mass of 300 milligrams. So we want to find the function, um, in this case, m sub zero equal or times two to the negative t over h. So like I said, that is that other formula that we can use. So we'll look at it, um, but the one in part b is the one that I'm going to use most often just because, you know, that's the one I remember, um, and that way I can just use the same formula every single time. All right, but if we look at that first one, what information do we know this time that we could substitute into that formula? Okay. So we know the half-life, right? And so the half-life in this case is 140 days, right? So our formula we know is going to start with M of T 
equals, all right, so where is that half-life going to go in the formula? Okay, so if we're using the one in part A though, right, we're actually looking at m sub zero times two to the negative t over h. So we don't have an r value in there this time. That's what we're gonna do in the part B, is we're gonna use that r formula. So if we're given the half-life, where's the half-life gonna go in this top formula? That's our h value, right? So we know we're gonna have some value times two to the negative t divided by, and then the half-life here is 140. And we need the t in the formula, right? Because we're looking for a function in terms of t days. Okay, the half-life is given as 140 days. So since those match up, we can just put it in as 140. Again, always make sure your units of time and half-life match up, because if those units are different, you're gonna have to do a conversion to make sure they're the same units. Now, what about our m sub zero this time? Good, so that's our starting amount, right? And we're starting with 300 milligrams. So we're gonna have 300 out front here and then times, oops, times two to the negative T over 140. So there is our function in terms of T um, using the half-life formula. Any questions about how we got any of that? All right, now, in the next part, we want to get it in this other form. So we want m of t equals, so what are we missing this time to be able to write this formula? What do we have to find first? Okay, so t is actually going to stay in the equation, right? Okay, so good, Taylor. So we need the r value. Right, so we need that decay rate so that we can actually substitute that into our formula this time. Well, we had that formula on the last slide that said R equals natural log of 2 divided by H. So that's what we're actually going to use this time to find that R value, and then we'll just plug that into our formula. Well, we said our half-life was 140 days, right? So that means we're just going to take natural log of 2. We're going to divide it by 140. Now we just want to know what is that rate of decay. You can put that in the calculator. And so what should that give us? And I would say in this case, probably keep um, five or six decimal places just because there's some zeros at the beginning. And so what do we get? Okay, good. And so 0 0.00495. And I'm just going to go with a one there. Okay, and so that should be sufficient. Just know the more decimal places you keep, the more accurate your final answers are going to be. Um, and so in WebAssign, sometimes you know, if you only keep that many and it tells you your answer is wrong, then go back and just keep all the decimal places from your calculator when you plug things in. Because um, sometimes just the rounding um, by you know, rounding it off there, it's going to round off your final answer in a different way. Um, so that's one thing I'll tell you in WebAssign because they're so picky. Just make sure to keep as many decimal places there as possible. Now, when we go back to actually create the formula, though, our m sub zero not going to change, right? That's 300, just like the original one. But now our base is going to be e, 300 times e. Now in the exponent, we need negative r. Okay, so just make sure you put the negative in front. And then we're going to use that r value that we just calculated down there. So that's going to be 0 0.004951. And then again, because we're doing a function in terms of t, we're just going to have our t up there in the exponent. Any questions about any of the pieces that I put in there this time? Okay, 
Now, what's nice about this, right, is that it doesn't matter which one of those functions I choose at this point to solve the rest of these questions. I should get pretty much the same answer, right? I did have to round off that last decimal there, so it might be slightly off. But in general, those two functions are going to be equivalent to each other, and so I can plug into either one that I want to. Right, so let's take a look at the next question now. We want to find the mass remaining after one year. So what am I going to have to do to find that? Good. Right, so since our half-life was in days, right, and everything else, our formulas that we created here were in T days, we have to make sure we convert this to days, which will be 365 days. Now we're going to take that, we're going to substitute it into our function, and again, it does not matter which one you choose, it should give you the same answer or at least very close, right? So which one would you like to use this time? Okay, so the ERT one, all right, so we're going to do M of 365 equals, and we're just going to plug in 300 e to the negative 0 0.004951 times 365. Okay, and again, just make sure when you do this that all of that stuff in the exponent stays in the exponent. Put that in the calculator. And let me know what you get there. Um, and it doesn't tell us what to round to, so let's just go with two decimal places here. Okay, so, all right, let's think about that answer, right? So um, Sarah's answer of negative 1.81, if we about that, uh, that's just the exponent. Good, right? Okay, so if you were to multiply that and then just do 300e to that power, see what you get for that. Um, now let's look at Naomi's answer. So she's got 827.89. Never mind now, it's too big, right? Because we know we started with 300, we know we're decaying, so we know it should be smaller than whatever we started with, right? Okay, so Kenneth's got 49.2, that's what I got. So if I round this to two decimal places, and that gives me 49.24, okay? Yeah, so be careful there, right? Because if you leave out the negative, then it's going to be an exponential growth problem instead. Um, so that will give you a larger answer than what we started with. All right, so this would be 49.24, right, if we round it off. What would the units be on that answer now? Okay, so... It's not days, right, because we're looking for mass, right? And if we look back at the original problem, our mass is given in milligrams, good. And so this should be 49.24 milligrams. Just always go back, read the problem, think about what you were looking for. Right? And since we were looking for a mass this time, and our mass was given as 300 milligrams to begin with, we know this answer should also be in milligrams. Now, again, always think about your answers, right? And that was good that I saw people in the chat thinking through, okay, well, wait a minute, that answer doesn't make sense, right, because it's too big, or we know it needs to be you know, smaller than what we started with, can't be negative, things like that. Okay, but if we look at this answer now, we started with 300. We know our half-life is 140 days. What that means is that every 140 days, we should have half as much as we had the previous 140 days. So in this case, if we started with 300, after 140 days, we're down to half of that, which would be 150. After another 140 days, we're down to half of 150, which would be 75. Well, we've gone 365 days, right? So we're going almost another 140 days beyond that. Half of that would give us 37.5. So we know we're somewhere between 37.5 and 75. And in this case, that answer is somewhere in between there. So our answer does make sense. But in general, just always make sure it needs to be getting smaller if it's decay, right? And always make sure you at least have a positive value, right? Because we still have to have some substance left over. Any questions on that one? All right. So now we want to know how long will it take for that sample to decay to a mass of 200 milligrams? How are we going to do that?
Good. So we're going to set the equation equal to 200 now. So 200 equals. Now, which one of these would you like to use? Because again, we can use either formula we want. The E one, okay. So it's going to give us 300 E to the negative point, oops. Negative point zero zero four nine five one. And we're looking for how long? We're looking for T this time. All right, so what are we going to have to do first then if we're solving for T? Okay, good. So divide by the 300. So when we do that, what's 200 divided by 300 going to give us? Okay, good. So that's going to simplify to two thirds. We have two thirds equals E to the negative 0 0.004951 T. Then what can we do? Take the natural log. Good, so we're going to have natural log, two thirds equals. And what's going to happen when we take the natural log of the right hand side? Yeah, the E fizzles out, right? And so we're just going to be left with negative 0 0.004951 T. And so then to get T by itself, we just have to do what? Divide, right? So divide by the decimal here. So we're going to have T equals natural log two thirds divided by negative point zero zero four nine five one. And at that point, we can just go to our calculator. Again, we'll round this to two decimal places. Okay, good. So 81.90 what that would round to. And then what are the units going to be on that answer? Days, right? So again, we were solving for time. We wanted to know how long, and our time in all these cases is measured in days. Okay, so just be real careful with your units here. Okay, so that's going to be almost 82 days to reach a mass of 200 milligrams now. And again, always think about, you know, make sure it makes sense. In this case, we know it would reach half the amount in 140 days. Well, that would be 150 milligrams. We're still above that, though, right? So we haven't gotten all the way down to 150, so we haven't gone a full half-life. And so the fact that we only had about 82 days as opposed to 140 days, okay, that does make sense. Okay, good. Any questions on that one? Again, we're not going to do the sketch of the graph piece here, right? But if you were to, you could graph either one of those top functions. And again, if you had kept all the decimal values, then those would actually be the exact same graph. Because we did off, they're going to be a little bit off, but they should look very, very similar if you were to graph those two graphs now. Anybody need more time on that one? Right. All right, so this is another popular um, application um, that you'll see if you ever take a physics class, especially um, maybe in chemistry, you might see it, okay, but it really is more of a physics option. So Newton's law of cooling tells us that if D sub zero is the initial temperature difference between an object and its surroundings, and if its surroundings have temperatures um, of Ts, 
then the temperature of the object at time t is modeled by this function down here, okay? Now, k is going to be some constant value, and it's going to depend on the type of object. So what this says is basically you're going to have to be given the k value, that's a constant, based off of whatever object you're talking about, because water is going to cool at a different rate from, say, stone, right? And then lead would cool at a different rate from granite things like that. And so you're going to have to be given a K value to know exactly what rate these things are going to cool. But then we can actually plug all that information into this formula here to figure out, you know, how long would it take to reach a certain temperature? What would the temperature be after a certain amount of time? Okay, kind of depending on what information is given. So that's what we're going to be looking at. The main thing to note here is this D sub zero here is a temperature difference. Okay, so you're going to actually have to probably do some work even to get that value because you have to think about it's the difference in the temperature of the object and its surroundings. Okay, so usually you're going to be given those two values and then we'll just have to subtract to find the actual difference between those two things. Okay. Any questions right now just on the formula? All right, so let's take a look at this problem here. All right, so we have a cup of coffee, has a temperature of 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's placed in a room that has a temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. After 10 minutes, the temperature of the coffee is 150 degrees. So we want to find a function that's going to model the temperature of the coffee at some time t. All right, so let's think about what we know in this case, right? So what's one thing that's given to us? Okay, we know the initial temperature of the coffee, right? Now, thinking back to the formula, is there anywhere to put the initial temperature of the object? So S is actually, so this value here is the temperature of the surroundings. Okay, and so in this case, the coffee itself, right, that would be the temperature of the object, but we're looking for the temperature of the surroundings to put for TS, right? And then D sub zero is the temperature difference, right? So that's not given to us either. So we don't actually have anywhere to put, sorry, just the 200 degrees, right? Because that's the initial temperature of the coffee itself. Do we have anything else, though, that we could put directly into the formula? The room temperature, right? Because that is the surrounding temperature. And so now we know the TS value is actually going to be 70, right? So I'm going to come back to this slide just so we can kind of see where everything's going. So in place of the TS, I'm actually putting 70 degrees because that is my surroundings temperature, the temperature of the room itself, okay? Now, could we find D sub zero based on the information that's given here? So find the temperature difference, okay? And how would we do that? Okay, so we want to know the so let me go back and show you what it says, right? So the D sub zero is the initial temperature difference between an object and its surroundings, right? So we want to know what's the difference between the object itself, the coffee, and the surrounding temperature. So how would we calculate that here? Good. So it's going to be 200 degrees minus 7. So our D sub zero we're taking the 200, we're subtracting the 70, and so that's going to give us 130, okay? Any questions about how I calculated that? All right, so I'm going to go 
back to this slide. So that D sub zero now is going to become 130. E is just E, right? So we've got that. Are we given the K value, the constant this time? We're not, right? And so that's going to be the first thing we're going to have to actually find. And so I'm just going to come back and I'm going to say, well, that's negative K times, do we have a T value? Oops. Ten minutes, right? Okay, so I can actually put ten minutes into my formula because I know that's my time. Well, that means the only thing we're missing, if we want to solve for K, would be T of T. So that would be the temperature after a certain amount of time, or in this case, the temperature after the 10 minutes. So are we given that information? Yeah, right, that's 150. And so we know we can put the 150 on the other side now. And now we have an equation where all we're missing is the K value, so we can actually solve for that K, because that's going to be the thing that we need to set up this equation. Any questions about any of the pieces that I have in that formula now? Okay. How are we going to solve for K? Okay, good. We got to subtract the 70 first, right? Because we need to try to get that E by itself, but let's move the 70 first. So if we subtract 70 on both sides, what's that going to give us? Good. So we get 80 equals 130E to the negative, I'm just going to call this negative 10K now, right? Because negative K times 10 would be negative 10K. So then what would we do next? Divide by the 130, right? So if I divide by 130 on both sides, we can leave that as a fraction. So what's 80 divided by 130 if we simplify it? Go ahead, so just 8 over 18. Equals e to the negative 10k. Then what? Natural log, good, so we have natural log, 8 over 13, and when we take the natural log of the other side, that's going to leave us with what? Just the negative 10k, good. And so then finally we just have to do what? Divide by the negative 10, and now we can just go to our calculator get that K value. So, let's go ahead and keep five decimal places here. Point zero four eight five five. that's what I got. And so there's our K value. Any questions on any of the steps to get there? All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the other slide now. I'm actually going to write out the entire formula. So we want T of T equals, okay, now in this case, we said the surrounding temperature was 70, so that's going to remain consistent, right? So we'll put that in there. Our initial temperature difference, that hasn't changed, so that's 130. And then we had E And then we have the negative K times T. Well, now our K value is going to become this 0.04855. We're going to have negative 0 0.04855. And we 
want the t in there, right? Because we're looking for a function in terms of t. Any questions on that? All right, so now we want to find the temperature of the coffee after 15 minutes. So how are we going to figure that out? Good, we're going to let T equal 15. So we're going to find T of 15. We're going to use that formula we just created up there. So 70 plus 130 E the negative 0 0.04855 times 15. Okay, now we can just go to our calculator. And you can actually put all that in there all together, right? So long as you're careful with your parentheses and everything. So let me know what you get once you do that. Okay, so 132.76, good. And so what are those units going to be this time? Degrees Fahrenheit, good. All right, so we're finding an actual temperature now. And so our temperature after 15 minutes would be 132, almost 133 degrees, right? Again, always go back, think about the context, make sure your answers make sense. Our temperature started at 200 degrees. We're putting it in a room that's 70 degrees, which means it's going to cool off, right? Um, we know after 10 minutes it was down to 150, so 15 minutes is five more minutes than that. It should have cooled off even more, and so the fact that it's down to you know 132.76 degrees now, that does make sense. Now, if you get something cooler than 70, you probably did something wrong, right? Because our coffee is probably not going to cool off to less than 70 degrees since we know that's the room temperature. And if you get something more than 200, you know you did something wrong because it's not heating up, it's cooling down. Any questions on that one? All right, so now this last piece, we want to know after how long will the coffee have cooled to 100 degrees Fahrenheit? So what are we going to do to do that? Good, so equal to 100, right? So we're going to say 100 equals, and then we're going to take that original formula we had up there, 70 plus 130E to the negative 0 0.00. 4855, and now we're looking for the amount of time, so we've got to solve that for T. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Well, thank you. So this should have just been 0 0.04855. Thank you. All right, so now our steps are going to be very similar to what we did to solve for K, right? Because we're still solving for something that's in the exponent. So first thing we want to do is move the 70 to the other side. So when we do that, that's going to give us 30 equals 130E to the negative 0 0.04855T. We're going to divide by that 130 now, and so that's going to give us... 3 over 13 equals e to the negative 0 0.04855t. 
Again, because we're trying to get the T out of the exponent, we need the natural log. So we have natural log, three over 13 is equal to just what's in the exponent there. So negative 0 0.04855. Sorry, it's getting small over there. And then we're going to divide. So we end up with natural log 3 over 13 over negative 0 0.04855. That should give us our T value. So then we can go to our calculator. And what do we get? Good, so 30.2. And the units there are going to be what? Good, so we're finding an amount of time. Our time here was measured in minutes. So just over 30 minutes for our temperature to go from 200 degrees down to 100 degrees. Any questions on that one? All right. So like I said, that's all I've got for today. Um, so we'll wrap up a few minutes early. Um, again, the homework uh, for these two sections is due by midnight tomorrow night. Um, the practice test is up, so if you want to start looking at that, that'd be great. Um, we will go through it tomorrow, though, and I'll post the actual test um, probably sometime this afternoon. That'll be due a week from today, so Monday of next week by midnight is when test four will be due. Um, if you have any questions about homework, the practice test, any of that stuff, just email me and let me know, um, and we can set up a meeting to discuss if we need to. Okay. Any questions before we go today? Last question on the homework. Sure. Let me pull that up. And so if that's not something you need to see, you know, feel free to go. Um, if you want to hang out and see me work through this one, you can. And I'm actually, I'm going to look at yours, Naomi, since you asked the question. So keep in mind that you know, some people's numbers might be slightly different. Um, but let's kind of work through this one. All right. All right. So the question here, um, actually, let me share this screen so everybody can see the question, and we'll come back to this. So this is the question we're looking at. So it says the burial cloth of an Egyptian mummy is estimated to contain 58% of the cartine it contained originally. We want to know how long ago was the mummy buried. And they give us, in this case, the half-life um, of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. Um, so, again, you have two options of how we can set up this formula. We could either use the actual half-life formula with the base of 2, still with a negative exponent, or we could use the m sub zero e to the negative rt formula. Either one's fine. Just know if you want to use the second one, you have to calculate the r value first, right? So which way would you like to go, Naomi, since you asked about this one, which formula do you want to use? Okay, all right, so if we use that one, that means we need to calculate the r first. And so remember that's r equals natural log 2 divided by h. And I'm, I'm writing this down and I'll put this back up. I just want to get all the numbers in there first and then we'll go back to my work. Okay, so what is our half-life this time?
Okay, good. 5,730. So that's going to give us natural log 2 divided by 5,730. And if I do that, it's going to be a really small decimal. And I'm going to go ahead and just keep every single decimal place here, right, just to be safe in case I, you know, answered rounds incorrectly or something like that. So since I get a scientific notation E of negative 4, I've got to move that decimal four places to the left. So it's going to be 0 0.00012. Zero nine six eight zero nine four three. Right. So, Naomi, did you get something similar to that when you did the R value? Good. Okay. All right. So, again, it's a really small decimal. It comes out in scientific notation. Just move that decimal four places to the left. Um, and that should give you your decimal. And again, I'm keeping all my decimal places here um, just to make sure that my rounding is correct in the end. Because honestly, you know, if I only keep, let's say, five decimal places here, that could be enough to make a 100 to 500 year difference in my final answer since the half-life is so large. Okay, so just be careful. Now, if that's my R value, here's what it says. We want our um, final answer to be 58% of the carbon that it contained originally. So when I set this up now, I'm just going to write this down, and then I'm going to go back to my notes so we can think about it. I think that's all we need. Yep. All right, so now let's think about this. So if we wanted to contain 58% of the original amount that we started with, our formula now is m of t equals m sub zero e to the negative r t. Well, we've got our e to the negative, all of that decimal, right? Zero, 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 one, two, zero, nine, six, eight, zero, nine, four, three, right? We know we're looking for an amount of time, so we're actually going to be solving for T. So what we're missing now is M of T and M sub zero. Well, in this case, if we just let M sub zero, we don't know the initial amount, right? Okay, so I'm just going to let that be M sub zero still. How much should our M of T be? It looks like I lost Naomi. So I'll go ahead and say this. So we've got 58% of what we started with left over. And so what we want to end up with is 0.58 times M sub zero. Because if M zero is the starting amount, we want to end up with 58% of whatever we started with. On the left-hand side now, in place of that M of T, we're going to put 0.58 times M sub zero. Well, now what I can do is I can divide both sides by the M zero. So that's going to give me 0.58, because the M zeros are going to cancel out on both sides, E to the negative 0.00012096880. And then just like any other problem where you have the T in the exponent, we want to take the natural log of both sides. We get natural log of 0.58 equals everything in the exponent here. Okay, All right, and I think Naomi's back with us now. Okay, so Naomi, what I did was since I end up with, oh, that's fine. Okay, what I did was since I want my 
my final amount to be 58%, right, of what we started with. That's why I put the 0.58 um, times m sub zero there. Now I'm just solving for t, right? So now the last step here is going to be, be to divide by that decimal. So I'm going to put that in my calculator now, see what I get. And so what I end up with is 4503 and then 0.06. But our directions here say we're going to round to the nearest 10 years. And so what would the nearest 10 years be for that one? Forty-five hundred, right? And so this is just going to be forty-five hundred years if we round to the nearest 10 years, like the directions said. And again, my guess is, you know, you could have said up correctly done everything yeah right so if you don't include all the decimal places there if you were to round this off you know to like 0. 0.00012 or probably even if you go all the way to the six like the nine six part there it's just not going to be accurate enough just because the half-life is so large um, so i would just say anytime you're going to do these especially in WebAssign, right go ahead and keep all those decimal places so that your rounding there is correct at the very end Okay. Any other questions before we go? You're welcome. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, have a good afternoon. I will see you tomorrow. And like I said, we will go through the practice test tomorrow, um, and I'll get the actual test posted later today. Um, so take a look for that. Okay. Um, so, Kenneth, I actually already have somebody scheduled to meet with tonight. Um, the homework's not due until tomorrow night, though, so if you want to set something up um, for tomorrow night, let me know. Just email me, um, and I'll send you an invite. All right. Any other questions? All right. Have a good afternoon.